Welcome everybody. What's happened this week? Anything? Right after we left class, I think it was that night or the next morning, the U.S. announced trade tariffs, didn't they? On uh, solar, we didn't talk about this. Oh, yeah. after. Solar panels and large washing machines. 30% tariff for protectionism. I don't know why those two industries. Some negative people say solar, so the cost of solar will go up and people will go back to traditional sources of energy. But washing machines, uh, who's, uh, Whirlpool's happy about that. Well, Maytag, I don't know which uh, washing machines are manufactured in the U.S. Samsung has a factory in South Carolina. Samsung got a factory in South Carolina. They were, uh, Mike showed it off to the governor. He's a big Trump guy. I asked. Because Samsung was planning to expand. Oh, they were planning to expand and then they. Yeah, they're thinking. Maybe not. But maybe they'll be rethinking again. Uh, I was pleasantly pleased this morning because I went through the test and everybody took the quizzes. So. Thank you very much. I, I thought we'd be missing a couple. There's still some issues probably with people that uh, have temporary access to connect. I'm not sure. I'll have to check that again. Uh, the scores on the quizzes, were they too easy? Never. Never? <laughs> scores on the quizzes were, were relatively uh, good. Uh, next week you have one more quiz to do, Chapter 5. And you also have to do the summary for the first case study. And I showed you where to find the case studies on Connect. Okay? So try to do at least a half a page. What's going on? And what's the biggest issues in the case? That's all I have to say. And why I'm doing that assignment, because we'll go into Google Hangouts and work on your responses to the questions. And I want to make sure everybody has at least done something with the case. All right? I think it's fair to the teams. Uh, tonight, I promised you I'd show you some videos <laughs> from the other classes. And then we'll do a short PowerPoint. And then we'll go, no, I think we'll go from the videos, we'll go to Google Hangout for about half hour to talk about this project. And then we'll come back for a PowerPoint. How's that? So in this class, I had how many teams, Matt? Go down. It's okay. I had five teams and I had four videos per team. So pick a number, one through five. I'll, I'll let you see any one you want. Two. All right, let's click on video, team two, video one. And I didn't do this for my other classes. I must be getting nicer. Can we stop for a second? I think it's called Asian. Is that one that loud enough? Asian. That's a couple points right there. of the region and the nature of infrastructure. So that's what they're talking about this. Okay, so go ahead. And it's mostly urban. Top exporting countries are China and the U.S. and products include integrated circuits and petroleum gas. The top importing countries are China and Singapore and the goods coming in are mostly integrated circuits and refined petroleum. Malaysia's exports exceeded their imports giving us a positive balance of more than 80 billion dollars. Can we turn another one out? We can't hear this, can we? Let's do another one. One number. Three. Three. Three, one. No, team three, one. Sorry, man. Yep. I shall be the same thing. Hello. This is video one of a four-part market analysis of the greater Oceania region, which includes Australia, New Zealand, and Indonesia. 
The analysis was researched and created by Mick Bushinsky, Joseph Fuco, Ariel Moreau's Brewer, Elton Pinto, and Helen Thelms. Australia is the first country we will introduce as part of Greater Oceania. It has a population of 23.7 million. It is surrounded by the Indian and Pacific Oceans and features a flat landscape. Its major cities include Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, and Adelaide. It also is the world's 13th largest economy in terms of gross domestic product and the world's 12th highest GDP per capita. It's a developed nation that's industrialized, as you can see from the pictures, and is a regional power. Australia's trade statistics are listed here, which includes a current account balance of negative 43.85 billion USD and foreign direct investment in Australia of nearing 615 billion. Top exports include oil and mineral fuels and ores, while top imports include industrial machinery and motor vehicles and parts. Main export partners are China and Japan, while main import partners are China and the United States. The United States and Australia have had a free trade agreement in effect since 2005, and total U.S. goods and services trade with Australia totaled nearly $65 billion in 2015. They also have bilateral investment totaling more than $1 trillion between the United States and Australia. Now we will look at Australia's infrastructure. The federal government is the main body in charge of raising revenue to fund infrastructure, while state and territory governments have much responsibility for planning and actually building public infrastructure. Infrastructure Australia, which is an independent national infrastructure advisory body, came out with a 15-year plan. The Australian government responded by aiming to focus on national freight strategy, urban rail plans, road reform, technology and data optimization, and accelerating planning and development. These new measures will enable better, more informed decision making in future investments and look to build upon Australia's already strong body of current infrastructure. New Zealand is the second country we will look at as part of Greater Oceania. It has a population of four and a half million and is located in the southwestern Pacific Ocean. It consists of two main islands which are both marked by volcanoes and glaciation. Its major cities include Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch. It has the world's 50th highest GDP per capita, which places it in the top quartile. It is also a developed country and has a very trade-oriented economy. New Zealand's trade statistics are listed here, including a current account balance of negative 5.385 billion USD and foreign direct investment in New Zealand of 71.19 billion. Top exports include dairy products and meat, while top imports include industrial machinery and motor vehicles and parts. The main export partners of New Zealand are China, Australia, and the United States, and these countries are their main import partners as well. Commercial ties between the United States and New Zealand are strong, and total annual bilateral trade of goods and services is at approximately 12 billion. The United States and New Zealand have had a bilateral trade and investment agreement in place since 1992, and the United States is New Zealand's second most important investment partner after Australia. Now we turn to New Zealand's infrastructure, where the government's objective is a resilient and coordinated infrastructure system, boosting economic growth and quality of life by 2045. The New Zealand Infrastructure Plan of 2015 forecasts infrastructure spending of $110 billion by 2025 and aims for a new approach to infrastructure management and planning in the nation. The National Infrastructure Unit, established in 2009, aims to monitor progress, perform project appraisal and capital asset management, provide cross-sector, high-level views of New Zealand's infrastructure, and work with the National Infrastructure Advisory Board to advise the infrastructure ministers in the country. The New Zealand Infrastructure Plan of 2015 is a 30-year plan with an overall goal of providing direction to infrastructure development in New Zealand and confidence to the private sector. The final country you will look at as part of Greater Oceania is Indonesia. It has a population of 257.6 million, making it the fourth most populous country in the world. It is a Southeast Asian nation made up of thousands of volcanic islands. Its main is Surabaya, Madan, and Bandung, and it's the world's 16th largest economy in terms of GDP. It is a developing nation with a much lower per capita income than New Zealand and Australia. Indonesia's trade statistics are listed here, including a current account balance of negative 21.28 billion USD and foreign direct investment in Indonesia nearing 293 billion. Top exports include oil and mineral fuels and fats and oils, while top imports include oil and mineral fuels and industrial machinery. Indonesia's main export partners are Japan, the United States, and China, 
and its main import partners are China and Singapore. Indonesia has seen great economic growth over the past decade, averaging between 5 and 6 percent annually. The U.S. bilateral trade of goods and services with Indonesia is roughly 30 billion annually. However, there are challenges to the economic relationship, including protectionist laws, limited infrastructure, and a weak rule of law. Now we look at Indonesia's infrastructure, which is the weakest in Greater Oceania. Probably the biggest problem relates to infrastructure funding. Essentially, 37% of funds for infrastructure must originate from the private sector. The problem is there's little enthusiasm from the private sector to commit themselves to long-term and capital-intensive infrastructure projects. Projects can be delayed years or canceled altogether due to land acquisition problems and bureaucratic hurdles. Furthermore, there's little certainty in legal and regulatory structures within the country. These problems, along with mismanagement, corruption, and incompetence, have led to a lack of quality infrastructure in the country currently. Solving these issues will open up more funding from both foreign and domestic sources for infrastructure in the future. Our references are provided here. Thank you for watching. Please look for videos 2, 3, and 4 of our group's marketing analysis of the greater Oceania region. Man, what did I give them? A 72 on that? <laughs> No, that one was good. Yeah. <laughs> Here, look out one more, just Team 4. Uh, does anybody know Mick? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> team 4, video 1, or? Yeah, 1. Let's do 1 again. Just, we'll short it. All in all, they were good, to be honest. That was only 6 minutes and 38 seconds, and he covered everything, didn't he? This one is not playing for some reason. Yeah. That's not going to work. All right, close it. Team Fem, Fem Spitali. The European Union South is comprised of four nations, France, Greece, Italy, and Spain. France shares its borders with Germany, Italy, Switzerland, Belgium, Luxembourg, Monaco, and Spain. Approximately 80% of the total population of France resides in urban areas. Located at the southern tip of the Balkan Peninsula, Greece borders Albania, the Republic of Macedonia, Bulgaria, and Turkey. Approximately one-third of the population lives in and around Athens. The remainder of the country has moderate population density mixed with sizable pockets of urban groups. Located in the Mediterranean Sea, Italy borders France, Switzerland, Austria, Slovenia, San Marino, and Vatican City. The majority of the Italian population lives in cities and villages. Only a fraction live in hamlets or isolated houses. Located in southwestern Europe, Spain borders three bodies of water, the Mediterranean Sea, the North Atlantic Ocean, and the Bay of Biscay. In addition to the bodies of water, Spain shares land borders with Portugal and France. The majority of Spain's population lives in the larger cities, including Madrid, Barcelona, and Valencia. Importing and exporting goods and services affects so you notice they did it in a different format. Is the top foreign trading partner to the entire European Union South region. Within the European Union South, Italy and Spain's top import partners are Germany and France. Vehicles and oil are the top imports equaling 21% of total overall imports to Italy. Vehicles are Spain's leading import at just under 14% of total imports. Mineral fuels, such as oil, are Spain's number two leading import at nearly 11% of overall imports. Germany and China serve as the top two importing countries to France. Machinery, including computers, are approximately 12% of total imports to France. Vehicles are also a top import to France at nearly 11% of the country's total imports. Greece's top import partners are Germany and Italy. Mineral fuels are Greece's top import at 34% of the country's overall import. Machinery and transport equipment, such as automobiles, are 14% of Greece's overall import. Throughout the region, vehicles and mineral fuels are imports on which the European Union South are dependent upon. Italy 
Germany's Spain's top trading partners are Germany and France. Italy's exports of machinery, such as computers, are approximately 20% of the country's total exports. Vehicles are also a top export for Italy, totaling 8.5% of overall exports. Spain's main export products are vehicles. Automobiles account for 19% of Spain's total exports. Machinery, such as computers, are a strong export at approximately 8% of total exports. France's top export trading partners are Germany and Spain. France is competitive in exporting machinery and aircraft. Machinery accounts for nearly 12% of total exports. Aircraft and spacecraft make a combined 11% of France's total exports. Greece's largest export partners are Germany and Italy. The top exported items are mineral fuels and aluminum. Mineral fuels, including oil, total 27% of Greece's total exports. Aluminum is 5.5% of total exports. The alliance between the United States and France is globally one of the oldest and strongest relationships. Greece has a strong economic relationship with the United States. The United States is one of Italy's most important trade partners. Notice we have a negative trade balance with all these. For the United States. In 2010, an average of 60.3% of the European Union's health population had access to the Internet. In 2016, that number grew to 74.7%, an increase of just over 14%. Despite the fact nearly 75% of the population has access to the Internet, less than half made a purchase online in 2016. This identifies a massive opportunity for retailers to market and increase their online sales throughout the region. In a 2016 report ranking countries with the top infrastructure, France was number 8, Spain came in at 17, Italy was further down the list at 57, and Greece had the lowest ranking among the four countries at 64. Throughout the European Union South, there are over 800 airports, nearly 2 million kilometers of paved roads, and close to 70,000 kilometers of railways. The combination of air, land, and rail transportation provide a wide-ranging network for U.S. companies to get their products to the European Union South market. Uh, you know, what's interesting is I, uh, when I was driving today, they were talking about Trump's State of the Union speech, and they talked about infrastructure, something that Democrats and Republicans should agree upon. And they gave me a number of where the U.S. was on that ranking, and it was pretty low. It was pretty low for our infrastructure. All right, I'd like to break out in our groups and talk with every group for a few minutes. And... Uh, then we'll come back. What time is it now? 7.51. So let's come back at 8.30, okay? 8.30, you can talk about your, on this. Uh, yeah. Let's go back up to the top. I got talked into uh, showing you more videos than, uh, than doing the PowerPoint. And you have both PowerPoints for this, these two chapters right on the website. So, uh, video two, let's try that team one again. I'll show you one of each. This is that. Welcome back to our video series. This is video two in our four part series. Thank you for viewing. We will begin this video by discussing economic environment. The gross domestic product of Norway is $356.2 billion with a 1.6% growth rate and an expected 1.7% growth rate of five years. The per capita is 33,393 per year. Be nice to have a chart there. Norway is one of the world's most prosperous countries. It benefits from openness to global commerce and regulatory environment that encourages entrepreneurial activity. The National Wealth Fund has created a system for the economy due to the growth of assets from hydrocarbon manufacturing. With Norway's multi-year procedure, they were able to reduce the corporate tax rate to 25%.
and plans to further decrease to 23% by 2018. The gross domestic product of Sweden is 473.4 billion with a 4.1% growth rate and an expected 2% growth rate in five years. The per capita is 47,922 per year. Sweden has the highest per capita out of all of the Nordic regions. Sweden has an open market policy which sustains flexibility, but rising portions of households with high debt is creating a risk to the economy. Although Sweden has a strong economic growth with 4.1% in 2015 as well as 2016. Sweden's financial system is one of Europe's largest relative to the country's economy and because it is interconnected internationally, it shows Sweden's role as a financial sector. The gross domestic product of Denmark is 258.7 billion with a 1.2 growth rate and an expected 0.7% growth rate of five years. The per capita is 45,709 per year. Because Denmark has an open market policy, this sustains flexibility and competitiveness with large flows of trade and investment. Also, launching a business takes fewer days and procedures than the rest of the work average because of this openness. Government spending amounting to 56.1% of the total output of the GDP over the past three years, with wow. public debt equaling about 45.6% of the GDP. Government spending has amounted to 56.1% total output of the GDP. Does that mean anything to anybody? I think the government doing most of the is kind of pumping up the economy. What else? Boy, that's very social socialistic. They must have a lot of social programs. I mean, our government spending, and I'm, don't quote me on this. Historically, it was it's in the 25 percent of GDP. I know we have a larger GDP, but 56 percent of the gross gross domestic products that value all the goods and services produced. And 50, the government spends 56% of that amount. That might be a mistake. Public debt equals about, well, okay, go ahead. But that, that stands out to me. Were the other ones like that, that high? That wasn't listening? Isn't Denmark the gross social? domestic product of Finland is Denmark an expected 0% growth rate of five years. That's actually capitalistic. Per capita is for more of a social. <laughs> per year. Finland has an open economy and the quality of legal framework is the world's highest, which provides high protection. Of nice if you show something about one country, you show Although the same thing about the other has benefit, They didn't do that. Finland has experienced a slowdown in uncertainty but it continues to try to help the economy by increasing its competitiveness and decreasing its public debt. We will now move on to discuss the financial environment. Yeah, can we close this one? The value of exports and imports together. Let's do another team video too. I don't care which one. This is the second video of a four-part series focusing on the economic and financial state of Greater Oceania. It was created by Mick Bishinsky, Joseph Fuco, Ariel Moroz Brewer, Elton Pinto, and Helen Thoms. This is Joseph speaking. Oceania is a series of island countries in the Pacific Ocean, covering an area exceeding 3.2 million square miles with over 10,000 islands. This presentation will focus specifically on Australia, New Zealand, and Indonesia. As you can see from the pictures, the capital cities are highly populated and developed. Australia and New Zealand have greater than 80% of the population living in an urban environment, while Indonesia currently has 54%. These percentages influence what products are sold and how they are marketed. Australia's financial overview. 
Currently, Australia has $1.2 trillion GDP. Its per capita GDP is $54,688, with household income of $107,000. The Gini coefficient ranks Australia at a 0.33, so the income inequality, while not perfect, is not the highest, but it does come in under the U United States Gini coefficient, which is currently 0.45 and the unemployment rate is 5.8%. Economic factors that influence the financial situation in Australia include its free market. They are currently ranked number five globally, making it very easy to conduct business or open businesses and trade. Um, they have a very efficient government that protects a lot of the property rights and really makes going through any of the legal actions necessary for businesses simplistic. They do have a higher tax burden than the other two countries within this region, being at 27.5%. Um, they are open to competition from all foreign agencies with very limited restrictions on who or what industries are showing a restriction. Overall, trade is moderately important to them, with 41% of their GDP based on trade. I don't know what some inequality in Australia. Trying to figure out what that chart goes with. I don't know what this chart goes with. I don't know what those numbers represent. And I should know. Okay. If you have a chart, it should go to something. Their GDP based on trade. The income inequality in Australia, while the Gini coefficient ranks them well, Ooh. is kind of off. 20% of the households account for 49% of the income within the nation. As you see by this chart created by McCrindle, there is a very high disparity between the lowest and the highest income earners. A lot closer than the U.S. Australia's primary form of currency is the Australian dollar. Currently with the exchange rate, one U.S. dollar is equivalent to $1.35 Australian dollars. That's um, $3.32 in Australian dollars to purchase. Our dollar is Australia has seen a reduction in its purchasing power dollar. over the previous six years following the 2008 financial crisis. Currently, their currency is 15.5% undervalued compared to what would be the norm, according to the MAC index. Interest rates have also declined over the previous 10 years, making it's cheaper for industries or people to borrow money, allowing them to expand the economy and continue with trade. New Zealand's financial overview. Big chart. Their GDP is $173.75 billion, with a per capita GDP of 35680 Household income is 45800 and a Gini coefficient of 0.33 the same as Australia. Unemployment hovers around 4.9%, and they are a, considered a free market ranked number three globally. Uh, they, just as Australia, both have strong legal protection. They do have a higher tax burden, 32.4%, making it more costly to do business within the country, but they also have few barriers to trade and foreign investments and it's easy to establish new businesses. They're actually one of the easiest countries in the world to establish a new business and making them great for entrepreneurs. 55% um, of their GDP is trade-based, making trade very important to New Zealand. New Zealand's currency is a New Zealand dollar with one U.S. dollar equivalent to a dollar thirty-nine New Zealand dollars. Um, new Zealand's purchasing power has consistently been weaker than the U.S. dollar and is currently 17.3% undervalued. Interest rates have declined over the past 10 years, just like Australia, providing a benefit to businesses and stimulating the economy. Indonesia has a GDP of $861 billion with a per capita income of just $3,800. Um, the Gini coefficient of 0 0.40 makes them have a much higher disparity in income between the population. This is indicative of a less developed country um, the, and, and economy. Um, yeah, we've had no, this currently I'm sorry, last time. To grow their economy. Through. Just a little bit, just a little bit. I want to show them something. Where, where it showed a Pepsi, where did it show a Pepsi or Coke? Right there, stop, stop. 
Oh, there you Yeah, you got it. Thank you. So based on what, when they're talking about undervalued and overvalued, they give an example of this, all right? Coke costs 225 here, 311 in New Zealand. Is that consistent with that one to 139? Is it at the same ratio? Yeah. Well, they're saying it's not, but the one that, the big back index is one that used in by economists, but uh, this is, a, they're looking at just the Coke, I think, on it, unless they got their information somewhere else. 1.39 three three, Oh, it's very close. Maybe they didn't do, maybe they didn't get the price. That's what it should be. Okay. All right, that's what the price should be, I guess. All right, go ahead, Matt. You can jump ahead. So this one, they did the financial and the economic together by country. And economy. Um, but Indonesia is currently working to grow their economy through deregulation, um, building an infrastructure, which in the future may lower this Gini coefficient, but it'll also help spur that economy and make it more open to investment. So right now they are a moderately free market, ranked number 84 globally with a very low tax burden of just 10.9%. The hardest part with opening businesses there is a burden, burdensome regulations with um, a very, not very transparent government that oversees it. And trade to them is just moderately important with it making up only 42% of their GDP. Indonesia's primary currency is Indonesian rupiah with $1 equaling just over 13,000 Indonesia rupiah. The Indonesian rupiah is currently 54% undervalued, which is significantly more undervalued than Australia and New Zealand. Additionally, interest rates for borrowing money are currently at 4.75%. While they have decreased over the past 10 years, this correlates to the undeveloped economy and the higher risk in lending and borrowing within the country. Financial and economic conditions within the greater Oceania region impact how U.S. firms conduct marketing. Faced with a strong U.S. dollar and industrialized nations such as China and Japan having a weaker currency than Australia, New Zealand, and Indonesia, firms must design more cost-effective competitive products or offer more value with the products, such as extra features. Furthermore, the population demographics in terms of location, urban versus rural, and income level require marketing plans to be more detailed with multiple product mixes tailored to each country in the region. The strong U.S. dollar is great for purchasing exports from the region, but acts as a barrier for marketing products produced in the United States. Utilizing local labor materials in these countries for production can reduce the impact of exchange rates, but will be met with high competition and reduced profits. Okay, you guys got the idea, all right? Uh, I'll show one video for video three and one video for four next week, okay? And so we're trying to understand these countries, you know, looking over them, <coughs> all four areas, right? We'll do uh, culture environment, political environment, legal environment. We'll take a look at them next week. And we have chapters on each of them. I know chapter four talked about the cultural environment a bit, and chapter five is going to continue talking about culture environment as, as a, as a works with management of a company. So uh, we'll call it a night tonight. And uh, I'll say good night. Just my favorite.